Thank you, Barbara. I am so glad to be here to talk about an issue that's really been my personal mission for about 12 years now. And the problem I want to talk to you about today is computer science's girl problem. The fact is there are too few women pursuing computer science in college and too few going on to pursue a career in technology afterwards. In 1986, when I graduated from high school, about 35% of computer science majors in college were women. That was about the same percentage of women as you saw in fields like law and medicine, some of the other sciences that were male-dominated at the time. And those fields have seen an increase in the percentage of women pursuing them, and some of them have even reached 50-50 or better. But computer science has seen a decline in the percentage of women pursuing the field. In the last year or two, the percentage of women majoring in computer science in college is around 18%. And the impact of this decline can be seen in the diversity numbers released by some of the top tech companies in the last year or so. And if you saw some of the reporting about this, you might have seen the percentages of female employees reported as high as 30 or 35 percent. However, those percentages included women who were working in marketing or sales or the mailroom. If you dug down a little bit and looked at the percentage of women who were employed in technical jobs as software engineers or programmers, the percentages were around 13 to 17 percent. And this is bad news not just for big tech companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft, but really for just about any industry that you can think of. To use one example shown here, big data, which is used in industries like manufacturing, retail, and agriculture, things that you might not associate with computing, these are being used to drive the direction of industry, to solve some of their problems, to figure out where they want to go. And not only are industries using this power of computing, but we're using this power to solve our biggest problems, like climate change, and whether or not genetically modified food is safe and effective and can potentially solve our world hunger problem. And if women are not at the table to help drive this direction, then that means we're missing the perspective of the women. We're missing, we're asking questions that are driven by one perspective. So why is this still happening? Why are there still so few women in computer science? Well, the reasons are really big and complex for sure, but I'm going to talk about only two of them. And the first is that the culture that our girls live in and grow up in or are embedded in is still a sexist one. It's one that disempowers them and saps them of their confidence. And two, I want to talk about confidence itself and how the key to really disrupting the gender gap in technology is in building our girls' confidence in the field. So let's start with the culture, and let's start with where that begins, the toy aisle. On the pink side are kitchen sets and dolls and soft, fluffy ponies and unicorns, and the message that that sends to girls is, you are destined to be homemakers and caretakers, and you're a little soft around the edges. On the blue aisle are trucks and blocks and building sets and superheroes. And the message that sends to boys is, you are going places. You're building stuff. You're designing things. This past summer, Target decided to eliminate its gendered toy aisles. And you wouldn't think that this would be a national crisis. But if you checked out Target's Facebook page, you might be proven wrong. For doing this, Target got some of these comments. I have always shopped at Target, but as of today, I will not step foot in their stores. I have grandchildren I always bought for, and I will not be forced to turn them gay. These are real. Target, this will cost you. I'm going to make sure of it. I have a plan to retaliate against you for catering to sexual deviance. Differences between men and women, boys and girls, do exist. Some of us refuse to be assimilated into this weird PC circus. And my personal favorite, 
If I am buying a toy for another child, not mine, I want to know if the toy is for the sex of the child I am buying for, not having to guess and look over the whole toy department. <laughs> These comments make pretty clear that there are an awful lot of people who still think that boys are meant for some things and girls others. And that can also perpetuate in the media. The Dina Davis Institute for Gender in the Media has done a lot of research in this area. And one of the things that they look at is what kinds of careers women are represented in. And as you might imagine, there are not a lot of female computer scientists in film or TV. Um, there are about 7% um, represented as computer scientists and 6% as engineers. And that's about half of those diversity numbers, which were already pretty bad. And one example of this can be seen in a show I actually happen to like, um, Silicon Valley, which is an Amazon Prime show where it represents a startup. And there are no women on the development team. And the men are portrayed as your sort of typical computer geeky guys who live in their mom's basement and they drink a lot of caffeine and they code around the clock and they're painfully socially awkward. This does not make technology look very appealing to women. And sadly, that boys club mentality perpetuates itself in the real world. About a year ago, an incident occurred in the video game industry that came to be known as Gamergate, complete with its own Twitter hashtag. Um, what happened is a couple of women who work in the industry happened to be a little critical of some things in the industry. It was actually part of their job to do so. And for that, they received death threats and rape threats and hate and vitriol that got made public via Twitter and Facebook and industry blogs, and it got so bad that several of them had to go find other places to live. Now you might be thinking, well, that's the video game industry. It's basically a bunch of teenage boys, right? I mean, they're going to go there. Well, um, while I was doing research for this talk, I found a great article on CNET about the gap, the gender gap in technology. And just a few comments down, here is the lesser version of Gamergate. I am the director of internet development for a digital agency. We would hire a woman in a minute to code for us, but there are none to hire, at least not any as qualified as the men. While I don't have the data to prove this, and they almost never do, by the way, I am willing to bet that the average CS GPA of female CS majors is lower than that of male CS majors. If a large percentage of the general population chooses not to be involved in technology, there is no reason to force change on an industry. If more women wanted to be in technology, they would be in technology. They don't, so they aren't. What's so hard to understand? And what we have to understand about those comments is that those commenters, I assume they're mostly men, but maybe not, um, they're hiring managers, they're sitting on search committees, they are potential co-workers. And what they think of women in the field is they're not as good as men, or they just don't want to be there. And so that can mean that women don't feel like they belong there. They don't have the confidence to even try. About five years ago, when I started working at Baldwin, um, I started a robotics club. And you all might know Baldwin. It's an all-girls school. It has a reputation for having really smart and confident young women. So I was in the library printing off flyers for the first meeting of the robotics club, very excited, and there was a girl standing at the desk, and I thought, yes, chance to recruit. Here we go. So I pulled off one of the flyers, I walked over to her, did my best Vanna White, there you go. And she looked at me and she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not smart enough for that. She could have said any number of other things. She could have said she was too busy, she didn't have time. Nope, she said she wasn't smart enough. And sadly, research bears out her reaction. Women often undermine themselves, don't believe in their own skills. In the Confidence Code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman, they cover a lot of research in this area, which is fascinating. And one of the studies that they covered was about a test that some researchers gave to a group of participants. And it was on three-dimensional shapes, which is an area where men typically outperform women. 
So they gave them the test, and they got the results back, and sure enough, the men had outperformed the women. But the researchers decided to look at the results more closely and figure out exactly why this had happened. And what they found was that the women hadn't even answered an awful lot of the questions. They just left them blank. So they decided to give the test again. And this time, they told the participants that they had to answer every single question. Can't leave anything blank. So they gave the test, they calculated the results, and this time, the women performed just as well as the men. So it's not that women don't have the skills, it's often that they don't feel confident enough in them to try. And this dynamic can play out in our classrooms. These are some quotes from some students in a first year computer science class at Carnegie Mellon. And the most common refrain from the female students is, I don't feel like I belong here, I'm not as smart as everybody else in the classroom, they know so much more than me, or that they're there because they're a woman to provide some gender balance, and sadly, some of their male classmates actually tell them that. So what do we do? How do we fix this problem? Well, first of all, you have to recognize that it's a problem, and I hope you have recognized that by now. So step one, done, check. Um, step two is we have to recognize that as educators, as parents, as administrators, we can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. What we do in our classrooms and our schools really matters. And let's start with our classrooms. Our classrooms actually send messages to our students about whether or not they're welcome to be there. So if you are inclined, as some of us who are geeky are, to turn your classroom into a video arcade or the set of Star Wars or Doctor Who, um, resist that temptation um, because it might be turning off some of your students, especially your female students, who feel like they have to have those same interests in order to even be in the classroom. Instead, come up with something warm and welcoming, something that doesn't represent a particular interest necessarily and that everyone feels like they can belong. And you might think, well, this doesn't really matter what my classroom looks like, so what if I have the Doctor Who set? Um, but it actually really does. And research that was just um, printed in the Washington Post shows that when girls are shown geeky rooms versus non-geeky classrooms, that they actually prefer the non-geeky room 68% of the time. Further, if they think that a computer science class is being offered in the non-geeky room versus the geeky room, they are three times more likely to take that class. So it does really matter. While you are redecorating your classroom, you might think about disrupting the narrative that the technology industry was created by men and is still entirely run by men. Put up some posters of some of these women, Maria Clawe, Valerie Taylor, Marissa Meyer, Grace Hopper, Jean Bartik, Carly Kloss, and if you don't know these people, you should look them up. Our assignments, too, can send certain messages to our students about what it takes to be a computer scientist, what computer science is about. Students of all stripes, male or female, tend to like assignments that are connected to the real world as much as possible. And female students often tend to like um, assignments that show that there's potential for them to help people or help the world in general. So they want to see that what they're doing is going to do good in the world. So here's some ideas. Connect to other disciplines. These are programs that write poetry. You can also write programs that analyze poetry or create art. This is a way to connect computing to areas that most people don't think of. Connecting to meaningful work. This is a simulation of the spread of viruses. And of course, the reason that you simula simulate the spread of viruses is so that you can stop the spread of viruses. I had a student that did this kind of assignment and was interested in medical research, and this really made an impact on her. Mark Gunstyle, a key researcher in the area of computer science education, who works at Georgia Tech, has done a ton of research in the area of how those assignments should be completed in a way that actually makes sure that students remember the concepts. So he recommends pedagogical practices like pair programming, 
peer instruction, or group work. And what he's found is that these kinds of practices can reduce the failure rate in an intro computer science class by as much as 50%. So it's a great way to make sure that they're learning. As an added bonus, these are the kinds of practices that girls tend to really like. They're being social while they're doing their work. It can really make them feel like they belong in this discipline. And those kinds of practices can become a part of what the National Conference on Women and in Information Technology calls an inclusive pedagogical practice. Most of you probably do this already or think about it. Um, it's the idea of sort of valuing all different skill levels in your class, of making sure that everybody contributes and you don't have the one kid who's dominating the discussion. In the last year, Google has done a lot of research in this area because, of course, they want more employees and they're going to need to get women into that mix. And what they have found, they have tried to find, figure out what will keep a, computer, a girl who starts computer science in high school involved all the way through high school and into college. And what they have found is that the number one factor is encouragement. And that encouragement comes primarily from parents, but also from teachers and peers. So these are actually really small changes. It's not hard. You now know what the problem is. That was easy. Um, you can put up a few new posters or take down some old ones. You can find some ways to create some new assignments. You can connect those assignments to the world and to doing good in the world. And you can practice a more inclusive pedagogy. Rearrange your desks a little bit. Call on the kid in the back who's never said anything. And the easiest thing of all, encourage your students. Encourage them when they're struggling and encourage them to go on and take the next class or to do something over the summer or to apply for a technology internship or to go on and study computer science in college. And I want to end with a quote from one of my students from last year that I think really shows the impact that implementing these practices can have on an individual student. Thank you for keeping your promise. You told me that at the end of the year, I would be able to understand and write my own code. I thought you were crazy. But here I am, having made my own animated and interactive game from scratch. Thank you for believing in me and not letting me give up. Caroline Kaiser, class of 2017. And that's really all I ask, that you keep your promise to your students, that you don't give up, that you don't let them give up, so that they can go out and change the world. Thank you.